OK, so, um, so I'm going to talk about introducing Jenkins to a big company, Enterprise IT. And my hope is I'm going to be able to tell you about what we did. And maybe you're someone who's here and you're doing that in your company. Or maybe you're looking for validation to make sure that the approach you're taking now isn't crazy. Because sometimes it feels that way whenever you're introducing change to a big company. Or maybe you just are here to kind of hear the story. And I got some, well, we've got some, a smattering of technical things in here too. So there's something for everyone. So yeah, I'm Dan Cuniff. I work on our uh, API team, api.target.com. Um, so, and it's useful to know the context here because I think the, the rest of the presentation uh, predicates knowing this part. So when I talk about api.target.com, it's a, uh, Target's API. So think about products, locations, carts, guests, reverse logistics, et cetera. Each one of those is an API that you can call uh, in a restful way and get back data about those things. And these APIs are exposed inside and outside of Target. So it's used, for instance, if you use the Target app on your phone, it's calling my APIs. Um, now, you might think, well, APIs don't change all that often. Um, no, they definitely do. So imagine for a moment um, that you're working on the locations API. And that's an API where you can pass in a store number, and you get back details about it, its hours of opening, whether it has a pharmacy or not, um, you know, its address, phone number, things like that. Um, but what if the business comes to you and says, well, hey, um, we want to know whether any uh, store has a Pizza Hut or not, because our, our stores have Pizza Huts in them. Some of them do. Could you just add that as an attribute to the JSON response? Well, yeah, you want to be able to do that really quick, right? And it's not just that. I mean, you're making changes all the time. We, we follow. Um, we follow semantic versioning, right? So um, the major version is the one that you can't break. The contract you cannot break, actually. If you do uh, make a change that's not backwards compatible, then you're triggering a new major, major version. And a new major version, by the way, is an entirely different API. Um, and then the other thing is, is that, I mean, you're doing patch stuff. If you're adding stuff to an API like that Pizza Hut for a store, that's just a minor change. And a patch change is just some change to something that maybe didn't affect the contract at all. But as long as you're not writing a brittle client, that really doesn't back, uh, break any type of backwards compatibility. I get, my point is, that in that story there, is, is that you're making changes all the time. Um, it's a product that you constantly make changes to. So obviously having CI there makes a lot of sense. The other thing to keep note of as well is, is that each one of those APIs is a separate application. API.target.com is not one application. In fact, each major version of an API is a, a completely separate application that is versioned independently from everything else uses very little shared infrastructure, just follows the same model uh, as each API, the same stack. So you can imagine I've got lots of applications, and it's rapidly evolving. Um, it's obviously a recipe for doing CI. Um, I mean, you should be doing that anyways, regardless of the things I said there, but it may, I think it, make it makes it especially important. So the problem was is that whenever we started this journey three and a half years ago, we didn't do CI at Target, actually. And it's a, there's a story about um, the way we used to do things. It was, I mean, maybe you are cut from the same type of place to where I've spent most of my time at you know, Target. Maybe you're from another big company where um, you actually had just, were probably still doing waterfall, manual infrastructure. You had a QA department that you let do your testing for you and stuff like that. And, and for all the reasons that we have, most of us understand, that's kind of difficult to work with. And there's better ways to do it, right? So most of you, a lot of you, I bet, you go home, you're really interested in this stuff, you do this stuff naturally, and you are, you're someone who's thirsty to learn new things. You knew there was a better way. And we knew there was a better way, too. We had all these APIs. I knew there were going to be lots of separate applications, lots of change happening. There had to be a better way to do it. And so, yeah, I mean, right, we just knew there was this thing called Jenkins. Um, most of us on the team heard about it. We're like, hey, let's introduce it. It's not something we use at Target, but hey, let's, let's stand up and see where it goes, because this is the only way to manage all this workload is going to be able to, to be done with something like Jenkins. Any other way, we'd be spending way too much time manually doing things, right? So it's one thing to stand up, right? We, we set it up. We installed it on lab server, got a couple jobs wrote for some people, um, started showing the value. But it's another, one to ch another thing to change habits. So, um, if you've got a team of people, um, 
you know, mix of contractors and you know, mix of obviously uh, team members who work for the company. Um, at first, you know, you're going to have this sort of ratio, and I, I don't know if it's the same at every company, but there's your ones who look at it like, oh, I love this, this is cool, I'm totally going to adopt this. And then there's other players, that, actors in the team that don't do it so much, right? They're like, well, I just don't get, I don't get the point, or um, you know, they, they just have a hard time with it. And even though the, the results are like right in their face, and they're, they're saying like, this is a good thing, they still like have a hard time adopting it. So if you think in a, and, and really this is just a recipe for any type of change here, but I'm, maybe I'll couch a couple examples in here. So you've got to do these things here to convince everyone to be on board with it. So within our team, when we first introduced it and we started rolling out and showing how important it was for our team, one of the first things you can do is just stick to key message. Just unwavering, don't come in and be the guy saying, oh, uh, you know, let's do this thing called Jenkins and then no one does it so much and then it fades away. That happens all the time. People come with good ideas but they don't stick with key message. Like stick with it and don't give up. Set, ex set expectations. I mean, with the people that, you know, that maybe are going to have a hard time adopting this, say, like, listen, we, we will not promote to the next environment unless Jenkins is green for your API, right? Um, and you, you kind of take a soft approach. You're not beating them with a stick or anything right, like that. But you, you do set expectations so that people have something to measure against. Uh, leading by example, it's kind of eating your own dog food. Make sure that anything you're doing, uh, you try to stitch into Jenkins, run it through CI to set a good example. Um, show the results, let them speak for themselves. If this is an actually a good thing, right, and you can get some decent reports out of Jenkins and other things that may look at it, like show why it's a good thing. Show that, you know, maybe in the old world where you were handing tests off to some other team to manually run them or something, that's, that's way too slow. And here you can commit instantly, get feedback instantly to the developer, run tests as many as you want, do as much stuff as you want to do. You know, let the results speak for themselves. And then just keep demoing. I mean. When you see someone or a cluster of people who are maybe having a hard time, just take time and go sit with them. Show them like, hey, here's what we can do with your set of jobs for your API, and just show the results that way. Demoing is just so powerful. Just go do it. Like, take a moment to do it. It's a hassle, but go do it because it really does pay off. So we're gonna th I'm going to talk about a, a whole string of like our uh, timeline here, of how, what we start out with, just so you can get a picture uh, for some of the later stuff I cover here. But uh, right. With APIs, unit and functional cases, uh, test cases, so in our world, we write our APIs in Grails, which Grails is just a framework on top of Groovy. Uh, makes it really simple, convention over configuration. Writing APIs is really nice with, with Grails. Um, basically, just automating that part of it, right? You've got some functional test cases for your APIs, right? Like pass this attribute or pass the slug into this API, you expect to get this response, do some assertions, things like that. Uh, we start out just basically doing that. I mean, that's really kind of the highest level stuff that you know, a developer wants instant feedback on to know whether he basically made more test cases pass or um, whether he broke more things, right? And then really quickly as we start onboarding all these APIs, because I think the total permutation, you count and take into account major versions at the time, we might have been around 30 separate applications. Uh, that ends up getting to be a lot of jobs to configure because the, the, the way it's structured, and I think I'll cover this later, is we have our parent folder, which is the name of our team, and then each API name, such as locations, guests, products, and inside there is the major version of each API, so say locations v2. So that's a lot of buttons to be clicking on, a lot of jobs to be configuring and everything else. If you're not already doing this, you should do this. This is something we recognized really early on, and it was sort of that axe sharpening moment where we were, we were able to cut down a lot more trees later on because we started doing this first. So the idea is, is you're, you're just using a Jenkins job DSL. That's code that goes into version control. Anytime you make a change to it, it goes to Jenkins and sets up all the jobs for you, which just makes it really nice. You want to make a global change across all jobs? Well, that's no problem. Just go to DSL and it'll apply it across all of them. So this is actually one of the earlier things we did. It's, I've, when I've talked to most people, they are doing it later. This is something I recommend doing earlier, though, because like I said, it's one of those moments where it allows you to move faster. I see some head nodding. That's good. Other things, like so peripheral things, right, like uh, uh, code coverage, you know, giving a developer you know, some sort of sense of, well, I, I wrote more code. Did I, did I, you know, do I need to write more test cases, right? And that becomes a criteria for whether you think that that's a, a promotable build or not, right? Static code analysis, pretty straightforward, right? Um, do you, are you writing if statements can never be true? Uh, basically loops that run forever, stuff like that. Security things, 
Um, you know, these are, this is something that's really easy, to, dead simple to stitch into Jenkins, creates more value. Maybe those stragglers who were, you know, maybe wavering on their, you know, adoption of this now are starting to be convinced, like, hey, no, this is really useful stuff. This is telling me stuff whenever my code's bad, and it's, and it's showing people in a public way that it's bad. Uh, another thing you can do, uh, perf test, right? Why, why wouldn't you do that? So imagine you've got your API program, or maybe you've got a website you're developing or something. Um, why not have like a, you know, sort of a, a, a base set of perf tests that are really about teasing the, the bugs that you maybe have introduced uh, at a very shallow level. They're not really the long ones. You, obviously, on every commit, you wouldn't want a developer to have to, uh, to, or basically, you wouldn't want him to actually have to run a big hour-long test or something, but just some, something to run for like one minute and hammer it with a, a fair load, just to give you an idea whether you made performance better or worse. Uh, and we actually, the image here is actually a, a blog post we have. It's target.github.io. It was one of our first blog posts out here. It got kind of a lot of attention because we have pretty innovative technique for how we do um, uh, perf testing. And it says a little bit about CI, but check it out if you're, you're interested. I think the presentation is shared afterwards and the, the link's obviously here. But if you don't remember, it's just target.github.io. Um, and we also do, so not just for each CI run, um, but we do have a separate set of jobs that are, uh, they're triggered manually, but they are much more bigger uh, performance runs. But right, it's a central place where you're one, telling people to go to see about test results anyways. You should put your perf results in there, right? It's just about setting expectations so people have a place to go. They're conditioned to think, oh, well, how, how was performance the other day? And then go in there and they're there. With everything else, it's about the health, you know, the QA health of the, uh, the API. So those are the larger ones, like, uh, you, you, this, all your, your large load tests that run for a long time, ones that spike, things like that. This is a, an API-specific thing. Um, and if you work on an API team, you maybe know about these type of things. Right? There's, there's Swagger, there's API Blueprints, there's other ones out there. Um, but API Blueprints are just Markdown, describing the, the interface of the API. Um, and Aglio is a thing that takes the actual API blueprint and then makes it, you can uh, turn it into really nice human readable documentation about the API. Well, because API blueprints are markdown and those go into GitHub Enterprise, well, just have Jenkins, like anything else that changes about the repo, see like, oh, a change was made to the API blueprint. Well, I'm gonna take that markdown, run it through Aglio to generate this nice static HTML file that I can host in a GitHub page, right? That's a pretty slick way to, to take advantage of that. If you don't do that, it's a really great idea, by the way. It's something that is uh, pretty nice. And the other thing you can get from API Blueprints, too, that you could also stitch in here in the Jenkins, which we haven't done yet. I didn't plan to talk about this, but now that I think about it, with API Blueprint, because it des describes your API spec, uh, well, there's all kinds of interesting things you can do with a Blueprint. You can create mocks from it. You can create SDKs from it, right? So what if you change your API Blueprint, you need to regenerate your SDK for some people? Like, that, that's pretty slick, right? Um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do with, API, with the uh, API blueprints or Swagger and other things, so. Infra's code, so for the first time ever, whenever we were, got really disciplined about infrastructure's code for or the infrastructure aspects of all those uh, API applications, is, is that really, I mean, the, the story is really in this, is, is that for the first time ever, we were able to see whether a, an infrastructure change broke an application or not, right? Because that infrastructure's code goes into the same repo where the code is, Jenkins runs, runs its tests, and you're gonna know for the very first time ever whether that change broke the application. That's something maybe if you went on the same journey as me, probably realize, and if you're doing this, you're like, wow, this is kind of a big deal, right? And I'll talk about later, but like why all these things are really important, why it all kind of comes together. Um, something else too is, Okay, so, I mean, again, these are all things that, you know, we just had in our backlog. It's not something we all did at once. It's just over time, they became the next highest priority thing. The moments to, you know, like the ax sharpening moments, just making things better. This is kind of one that was a big deal. So these environments where these, te where uh, lower environments where CI was running, you know, in a test environment and stage before it goes to prod, you're, you're running tests there, and some of those tests are destructive, right? Especially if you do anything on an API that isn't a git, so a, a delete, a put, or a post. It's changing data underneath and everything else. Well, and you can do this at different levels, of course, once you t start to think about what I'm gonna say here, but why wouldn't you, on every CI run, just have Jenkins tell Chef to call OpenStack 
to call the API to spin up a server and basically boot up the image, deploy the latest jar out there, because we deployed jars, not wars, and then test the application that way. Right, because it's gonna the environment's gonna change. You want a fresh environment every time to know that your tests are you're not gonna have to worry about some destructive thing that happened with a previous test or a change that was unrecoverable that you have to worry about for each run. That's that's a bit silly. You don't want to do that. So um, it's a great idea. Like don't love your environments, they don't love you back. Just tear them down as soon as the CI run is done and spin them spin them up when you need them again, right? Uh, deployments, so the te te technique we use there is um, we pin um, a version. So we have a separate repo that has a list of each of the environments, like CI, test, stage, prod. And in there is basically just JSON, which says, for products, V3, uh, what is the version? And it'll say, like, 3.6.1. When you're ready to actually have the code deployed to the next highest environment, you basically just go in there and go 3.6.2. Jenkins sees that there's a code change. It tells Chef to like, hey, guess what? We've pinned a new version, and needs to be deployed, and it's deployed. And then it basically becomes a trigger for the next downstream environment to go ahead and run. You might be thinking, why even manually do that part? Why even spend all the time to go in there and manually change a number? For, for us, it's a manual gate. We, we don't really technically need CD. I mean, maybe if you're, you have a website and it's, um, you, you need to be making changes all the time, like literally all the time, like that, that makes a whole lot of sense. It will make sense for us someday whenever we really get comfortable into that point, but this is a comfortable gate for us actually. And it really sets us up in a ripe type of way where we can go to CD if we want to. So I recommend that as an approach. It's a dead simple, you can see what version everything is at in a single repo, and it's straightforward actually how it you know, deploys and promotes. So it gets us really close to CD, maybe we'll get there someday if it becomes the next highest priority. Right, and it pulls, a, I didn't mention the artifactory part. So um, these uh, jars, which is just embedded Tomcat with the Grails application, are just put in artifactory. So that's where Chef knows to go to get it from. Uh, yeah, so other things, like peripheral things about this whole API program, right? You've got um, things like PagerDuty. And if you've got all these APIs, any of you using PagerDuty, you're, you're already starting to imagine this, I bet. You've got all these APIs, and there's a concept of services, escalation policies, and on-call schedules. That's a lot, a lot of button clicking. So why not just take advantage of the PagerDuty API, put all that stuff in something like JSON, and just actually have people change it through there, right? So Jenkins sees the change, calls the API to make the appropriate changes to PagerDuty. For us, it's been about setup. It's less about the continuous change. So we're trying, trying to make that a little bit better. But for us, it's, we don't want to click on buttons, because then I can't see I can't see what someone changed, right? You should put almost everything you can in version control because then you can see who made the change at what time. Um, everything's a pull request, it all gets approved. But if you're clicking on UIs, you know, whether it's in Jenkins or PagerDuty, you don't, you don't know what changed. You have to find out, you have to go on HipChat and say, hey, who changed such and such? And then maybe you'll get an answer. So kind of the same thing, but for the monitoring tools we use, we use uh, Splunk and RunScope. So uh, Splunk is, we don't configure it through the API, but the way you can configure it is through config files and other things. So it makes sense to put those in version control in the same way I was just talking about PagerDuty, right? Same thing with RunScope, it's got an API, so a lot of button clicking going on there. You don't want to do that. Put in version control, version it, see who changes it, et cetera. These are kind of future things, and I've actually seen a couple talks about this so far. Um, so the Every time you have a pull request, that's your code review. I mean, it's someone uh, who has the ability to, to merge it to master uh, to say, yeah, it's good, I'm gonna merge it. And they really kind of have to go on this sort of intuition in their gut that like, yeah, it looks good, and I'm assuming that the developer who's doing it would test it locally and other things, but you know, who knows? Who knows if it is good or not, really, right? You really want it to run through Jenkins. Um, the previous talk um, kind of covered this, actually, if you were in this room. And it's something we want to do. We've actually tried it, just uh, ran into something else, but we really want to do this. And I do recommend it, though, because it's just something else you can do to increase the quality um, and know that what you're getting ready to merge is someone who merges pull requests, whether it's good or not, it's going to break the build, right? Uh, other things, right? So like, uh, 
why not stitch in things like uh, vulnerability testing? Uh, you know, if an API program run it through something like Z Attack Proxy, it would run every single time. You, again, it's just another piece of feedback you can give a developer to know whether he introduced some type of security vulnerability. And there's lots of tools like this I think you can stitch in, so. We kind of talked about the CD stuff before, kind of there, really close. Um, the promoted builds plugin looks interesting, right, because then we start to make the whole flow of that determining whether there's a good build or a bad build is ready to go to the next environment. So those are kind of things we got lined up. It, we should have done this one a long time ago, but I mean, right now the, you get a notice. Most of your notifications from Jenkins are not going to something like chat ops, and that's where we spend most of our time anyways. We just need to do this, just haven't done it yet, but I think there's a couple people who've talked about that so far, and that's a great idea. We just need to do it. There's a plug-in. We just need to literally like take five minutes to set it up, so. Uh, things that didn't work, uh, build per branch. It just turns out it wasn't a part of our workflow. We don't do branches, actually, in our, in, in, right, there's a million ways to do whatever you want to do and get. But we just don't, we don't do branches. We tried it out for a little while, but just learned two things. One, that we didn't want to do branches and that just didn't need this plugin. But I think really the lesson here is, is that if you're introducing Jenkins to, you know, your the enterprise where you work, company where you work, just fail fast and let go of the things that don't work and try new things if they work good. I mean, keep stick with the things that work good. So. Something that's happening now is Jenkins Operations Center, which really, the story there is less, you're, you might be thinking, wow, you took a big leap to Jenkins Operations Center, right? Well, so Jenkins spread like wildfire. So let's take a step back. I've told you about a lot of things we've done so far with Jenkins in the API program I work on. Now during that time, remember there was a time scale to that, during that time, people started to see what we were doing. They were thinking, hey, I want to do development like that. I, I don't like doing it the old way. I actually want to keep my heart rate low and enjoy you know, working and doing development, right? So they saw this start uptaking this. Other teams kind of coming out of the woodwork being like, hey, you know, we're, we're going to do this too. And what you saw is a sort of just like organic clumping together of all these teams who got together and said, ah, oh, we're gonna start using Jenkins. Some ran their own Jenkins environments. Some of them we shared our environment with. We said, hey, you know, like, sure, you can use our environment. And eventually there was a team who wanted to own this and they took it and they started building it out. But yeah, you get a lot of people in one Jenkins instance, completely disparate teams wanting their own set of plugins and other things on slaves and whatnot. Like it gets, it gets pretty hairy pretty quick. So um, for us, we, Back to that earlier point, um, uh, Jenkins Operations Center makes a lot of sense. And I'll talk about that at the, at the bottom, but let's keep going on this journey here. So yeah, in the beginning, just a small, t our team, and there's a small dot .com team. And we, if you think about this for a minute, whenever this started emerging, and, and maybe your timelines are the same, the companies you work for, or if you're just now getting into this, some of you, like the conversation, the window is wide open for you to start talking about this, but things like Jenkins and continuous integration were at the intersection of these important conversations that enterprises are starting to, you know, introspectively look at themselves on. Like, you know, are we, it is important for us to care about automation, stop doing things like waterfall, be a little bit more agile where it makes sense. The DevOps story, right? And it's right at the, you know, the intersection here. And it, that's been true since the beginning. Um, take advantage of those things. Talk about if you're introducing Jenkins now, stitch your story into these conversations because you'll see that when people uptake these things, they're probably going to use Jenkins. That's what everyone else does, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to, to sell it easier that way. Oops. <clears throat> now, to the earlier point, you're, you might remember how I was talking about how we introduced it just within our team, and I kind of had that generic recipe of, ingredients on how to sell stuff. It could be applied to any type of change you want to apply. Um, but these are kind of on a macro scale here, right? So getting it to the point now where it's not such a skunk works thing at the bottom where you know a couple dozen teams are using it, now it's becoming a standard, right? Like people are saying, oh yeah, I'm starting a new project, I'm going to use Jenkins. You, there, all kinds, any change is difficult. And I know you know this if you've introduced anything to your companies. Uh, you gotta sell it. It doesn't always naturally sell itself in certain corners. Um, there's the political stuff, you know, be crafty. All the things that you did before to make something successful and had to convince people, there's politics involved. Just suffer through it and, you know, 
partner up with people who are good at those type of things. Uh, becoming the path of least resistance. So that's saying have people naturally come to it because anything else they do is hard, right? And maybe they don't know that's a path of least resistance, but for some people, they understand that. They, maybe they don't want to bring in some other technique or, or whatever else. They're just saying, I just want to be the path of least resistance, and they come to you naturally. That's, you want to set yourself up for that. So don't create barriers for people to be able to adopt it, right? Uh, you've got to convert the change resistors, right? There's people who are going to be in your way. It kind of weaves into the, the political bit it, you know, a little bit, but this is more about the people on the ground who are peers of yours, and they're resisting it for whatever reason. You know, there's some type of change there. Right? We've all been through that sort of grieving cycle of change, right? The, you're upset at first, and then you're compromising, and then adoption. I think there's actually five steps to it, but I don't remember them. But yeah, you got, you've you got to work with them. And who knows? You know, maybe those type of people will be the people who help make this even better, right? Because they're, if they're good at resisting, they're probably good at adoption and encouraging others as well. So people come around, and that's, you really want to embrace them, actually. It's not an abrasive thing. And then, same as last time, just demo. Now it's not just demoing to your team. You're going to other areas, right? You're going to other teams that are big that you know are influential, and you're saying, hey, we're doing this Jenkins thing, and here's all the things we're doing with it, and here's why the results are great for us. So if you're doing that, you're demoing, these are all big things that become the enterprise more broader, like it takes off. You're selling it at a much higher level. These are all things that help. And then when you start getting this adoption, it's less of resistance and now it's about adoption, people start to ask for enterprise grade. And so for those of you who work in enterprise, you understand what enterprise grade means. It can mean a whole lot of things, right? But it's often asked for. And so, right, there are some actual material things in the next slide I'll talk about, but that's where Jenkins Enterprise comes in. So we start actually with open source Jenkins, work just fine. But when you start to get these other teams on board, you do need to start to do other things, like job folders. So we had our parent folder in there I was telling you about before. When you start adding other teams, you don't want to meddle your jobs with someone else's jobs and stuff like that. You really want to set up folders. Once you've got folders, then you can do the role-based access control stuff where you're f fixing people to uh, you know, roles and the roles to, to jobs and stuff like that. It makes a lot of sense. Keep your stuff separate. There's a whole territorial stuff. When you've got teams, disparate teams who don't interact with each other for any reason, but they are sharing the same tool, you do want to like give them their own place to do what they do. It encourages adoption, right? If anything, um, and obviously security and other things. Uh, HA it makes a lot of sense, right? There's these teams who, if it goes down, they're upset and saying, "Ah, I can't, can't do my work." So HA makes a lot of sense. It's really nice to have that from uh, Jenkins Enterprise. And then plugin usage. So if you are, we started out managing it and eventually went to another team. But it was nice to see plugin usage, which ones weren't being used. Um, if we were going to do an upgrade, here's the job folders that's using it. We ought to contact those teams and let them know, like, hey, we're going to be upgrading this plugin. Hope we don't break your stuff, you know. So it's useful for that. And then other things is uh, support from experts. So what I'm talking about here is that if there is a problem with Jenkins, you got someone to go to. And in our case, CloudBees is actually, we really did submit a couple bugs and had questions on things, and they're actually really helpful. So if you're finding yourself in a position where you're thinking about it, I mean, for the cost, it's actually worth it. Uh, we actually, I feel like we got our money's worth out of it because they're really helpful, and they actually fix, fix pretty low-level bugs that we ran into, which is kind of nice. Otherwise, you're doing that stuff yourself. And then scale for everyone else. This brings me back to the Jenkins Operations Center stuff. So um, the <laughs> environment started to get pretty messy. Everyone on one Jenkins instance. JOC makes it nice where you can um, actually let people have their own master and slave combinations, and it's managed at a much higher level. That's just another logical breakout with a, a piece that manages on top. For the team running Jenkins for your, for your company, if you're set up that way where there is a single owner, it makes their job a lot easier, right? Um, and you want them to have that, because you want them to upgrade frequently. You want to be able to make changes to it. Well, something like this enables that and allows that to happen. Hey, we're hiring. So if anything I said sounds good, you should come, uh, you should come talk to me. It's, uh, Target's actually a really good place to work. I've worked there for 10 years. Um, it's a really great place. And we actually have openings. So I mean, you could come talk to me. I could talk to you about openings. So come find me. What's that? Where? Oh, we're based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> you want to come there, right? <laughs> yeah. 
But there's a lot of snow. If you like snow and you like to ski, you can come up there. <laughs> the weather here is awful in San Francisco. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thanks to the sponsors. Thanks, everybody.